my teeth were all knocked out, my jaw was broken, my ribs were broken. By? Uh, by my dad at the age of nine. Right, and did the right thing to separate the two. And Def it created a huge with division. That. I looked pathetic. And a pair of football, dirty football boots that I played in on a Sunday before in an, Asda, in an Asda bag. I had a droop problem, so I'm to, to be totally honest with you. Right. So you wouldn't go to Saudi if someone, if someone comes across to you and goes... No, I didn't say Saudi. Yeah. Because we all like money. He left me so many times going in and out of jail that I had to grow up on my own. Yeah. But I've just left my two-year-old son there. So I'm mm. no better than the man I was saying did all this to me because I'm doing it to him. I think Daishi made me a man, Jeb Franco made me a player. This is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So with this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up to proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way. And more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, someone with a host of highs and lows on and off the pitch. A goal scorer and leader, known for forthright honesty, unlike many modern day footballers. From bricklayer to the Premier League, from prison to an FA Cup final, Troy Deeney, welcome to Upfront. That's an introduction, isn't it? It's probably the best one I've had in a long time. Is yeah. it? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Okay, listen, um, I, it's been brought to my attention by one of the producers of a quote attached to you in relation to me that I must be privy to, which is, tell Simon I love him, mm -hmm. but he's a bastard. Yeah. That's good, though, isn't it? Well, I guess it's probably balanced, <laughs> isn't it? No, he's, no, he's very good. I, um, I obviously didn't know you before yep. TalkSport. We met. Yeah, we did. And obviously, for people that don't know, we started at TalkSport at the same time. And I think just two newcomers into a world, into a new world. Obviously, you're more uh, savvy in the business world than, than myself. But I think a little bit of business comes into that as well in mm. terms of having to... But the, med the media is a unique space, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you have to understand yeah, how yeah. people work, yeah. how it is now, and... Uh, drop your ego a little bit, uh, leave it at the door. At the same time, I think also, I think there's there's a, a benefit, and more so as society is beginning to turn again about authenticity. Mm -hmm. We went for a period, and we can discuss this with certain yeah. trigger subjects that were very prevalent two or three years ago, where you can't speak your mind. Yeah. Because if you did, people took exception to it. Yes. But w one of the key focuses of the way that I start these shows, of all the various people that have been here before, is to get to find out what was their journey. What was okay. their why? Yeah. What made them and what were their experiences in life? And reading your backstory, I'll tell you what, son, you've had a, you've had a background. <laughs> um, yeah. So, again, it's about understanding yeah. what made Troy Deeney do the things he did. What was his background? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me there's a lot of adversity in a lot of sports stars' lives that they've mm -hmm. used in one way or another. Yeah. So why don't you walk us through? Because yours is very varied and it looks like it was very challenging at times. Yeah, so... Um, very, very young, very early on, I was, I was open. My, my eyes was open to what we would consider my reality of the real world. Um, I have a th this thing around the word normal. I hate the word normal because your normal and my yeah, normal are completely different. different. Yeah. So it, that was my sense of normal. Irish and Jamaican background, very, you know, very low income, hard working background. My granddad was a taxi driver and you know, got the gift of the gab, love to be in the pub, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, from when, from the age of nine, I got I got into some, you know, domestic abuse problems with my dad and my mum, which actually I could give you a first. I've just had my teeth fixed, so. Right. My teeth were all knocked out, my jaw was broken, my ribs were broken. By? Uh, by my dad at the age of nine. Right. Um, but this was, is not your biological father, no, this is my, your stepfather. My, my, you, yeah, my but biological you dad, he, your dad yeah, right? yeah. he left as, uh, freaking out, he left after, I think I was about six weeks old. Right. So we refer to him as a sperm donor. Right. We don't really talk okay. about him. Um, right. I think he's still, I know he's still alive, but I think he's still in He's had no part so. in your life at all? No, not no. at all. And then, yeah, so then my dad, who took over from, from like five months, six months, all the way up until he passed away uh, 10 years ago, unfortunately. What was the catalyst for that, if you don't mind me asking? My mum left him. Right. So my dad was a, you know, was involved in, in a lot of street stuff. Um, was very well known in the, in the area and still he's very well respected to this day, even though he's not around. Um, and he just couldn't take it that my mum left. In the long and short, my dad went off to jail and my mum, my nan, it was very much our business is behind closed doors. Yeah. And up until writing the book, that was the first time me and my mum had genuinely spoken about right. the situation because I had a completely different, as a nine-year-old, I think my my coping mechanism was to just it happened, but look at all the great things that happened afterwards. 
Right. When my mum was like, well, actually, do you remember that your dad come to the uh, come to the school three days before and was trying to intimidate my mum in the car? He had a hammer right. and was just knocking her on the knee, like, you got to come home now, aren't you? Right. That kind of, you know, that kind of stuff. But obviously, I wasn't pri uh, privy to that because I was in school while that was happening. So um, the development of the book was to have that conversation right. with my mum, to, to tell my story in a way that... Catharsic? Yes, a little yeah. bit, but also to tell it in a way that it's not just my story. Right. Because I think you have a story, but there's so many people around you immediately that can have different takes and steers on of it, yeah. how you are. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's what it was for me. When you look back on your father and you look back, because I think there's things in there that are not admirable, but there's also things in there that are admirable in yes. terms of his attitude towards you. Yeah, and putting he's you the into biggest football. oxymoron yeah. I've ever met in my life. Right. He is, yeah. as, as a, as a But when as you a look human. back on it, what's your what's your overriding and overarching thoughts about him? Well, it's, it's funny because now I'm in a space of, of, of reflection. So I used a long time in my life blaming that incident and, and being right. scared and all of that. But when I actually look back, what did he fundamentally give me? A structure to life. Yeah. Be respectful. Your last name is your first name. So if anyone hears the name Dini, you're not representing you, you represent your whole family. Right. So make sure you put your best foot forward. You will say please and thank you. Um, I don't know if you remember this. If you remember the first time I met you in Talk Sports Studio, I called you Mr. Jordan. You did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's from my dad. Yeah. Until somebody gives you the, 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 the credibility to say, no, no, please call me Simon. Mm. I look, that's, that's just how it is. And those fundamentals, yes, they're not, the best things in the world but i think anything that's free is most valuable in this world that's how i've been raised so mm -hmm. um those things he's, he's instilled in us and my dad had three boys and one girl all of us boys have been successful in football my youngest brother's 16 and my dad died when he was five he's at west brom right my sister gymnastics and you know got to a gb level and then my dad passed away and she right. she stopped as well but we all, if everything was so bad, and yes, my mum plays a wonderful part and I'll always give my mum the credit, but yeah. if everything was so bad, how did we all become good? Yeah, that's right. Do you get no, what I, I mean? No, so I, I, look, I look at it now from a, a different um, a different world, a different lens, yeah, a different I suppose. different prism, yeah. Do you think that your life was one of slightly being deprived and having a significant amount of adversity? Because I've seen that in other guys. I saw mm. it specifically in Tony Bellew, to some yeah. degree in Johnny Nelson. Mm -hmm. It does one of two things, isn't it? It either makes people go underneath it, mm -hmm. or it makes people rise and respond to it and use it as some sort of um, catalyst to yeah. want to do things better. So I, I did both, funny enough. Again, because I was nine years old, I didn't really know any different. And then at 11, so I can't touch my shoulder, I don't know many people don't know this though. I got kicked off a um, as a kid, played around and got into like, a silly kid, childish argument, like someone said, I don't know, your mom or whatever, one of yeah. childish uh, jibes. And I tried to climb up to, to get the guy for the, um, like an electric power cable thing that was around the area. And he kicked me off. And as I fell, I turned, I fell like 11 feet. And as I fell, I put my arm across my face like this and I put my arm on a, on a wall and crushed all of this. So all this is metal. And then after that in incident, and I was like, no one will ever put their effing hands on me again. And then from 11, I kind of used it for for better, but also out of fear, because I was thinking now, right, you, you're becoming a victim here. Yeah. Don't let don't let that happen. Given, and I don't want to dwell on it too much, yes, but it's, it's a part of the, the, the fabric of you as a person, because you're very personable and very calm and mm -hmm. balanced. Um, and often people that have come from great situations of adversity, as we've spoken about, with the anger that fuels mm -hmm. boxers and maybe the challenges that in other people's lives that make them either become antisocial or go off the rails or have a disposition towards life. You don't seem to have that. Would you have had the ups and downs in your life and the journeys that you've been on, because we're all the sum of all our parts, right, if you hadn't have had that adversity? Well, well, who knows? I don't like to, to look on what could have been because fundamentally, other than playing international football for England, I've done everything, yeah. so it's been it's been really it's been really uh, fruitful in that regard. I think I understand your question, and I think it, it has a yes and a no. Um, I think it's made me a poor father at the start. In what I, way? I, I followed a lot of the traits that I grew up with. So being what? No, no emotion, no hugs, no kisses, 
very standoffish with my kids. If they did good at school, that wasn't good enough. You need to do better. Right. Because that's what... How old are your kids? So my oldest is now 14. Right. And I've got two girls that are... So you'd have been very quite. You'd have been very young, wouldn't you? Twenty one when I had yeah, my first. Yeah. yeah, when I had my first son, and I also went into because I they're my only two reference points. My granddad and my my dad. My granddad worked all the time, came home, gave my nan the money. She took care of home. So I used to say to myself, if I'm at work and I'm earning a pound note, I'm doing my job yeah. more than as we know now to be nurturing and help, mm. helping and trying to understand your your children. When did you have these epiphanies? Because this is a case of awareness, isn't it? Yeah. Five years ago. Right. But then, what was well, the trigger for that? Uh, I had a drink problem. So I'm to, to be totally honest with you. Right. Um, not a, an alcoholic to where you would see, you know, me on the street or whatever, but drinking way too much. Right. Life was out of balance. I was burning the candle at both ends. And it was taking it was taking its toll on me. I was, as you were saying, I'm very personable. Yes, that that is me. But yeah. if I'm drinking, I'm actually very anti. Side. Yeah, very antisocial. Why did you? Why did you? I mean, it's, uh, without it's no judgment in this conversation. No, no, no why, why, as a professional sportsman, mm -hmm. did you develop a drink problem? Is it something that was a legacy of your childhood and you started when Every, you were younger, everyone, or is it just the culture? The, it's the culture that I grew up in. Right. So, my 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 new partner, my fiance now, she is so baffled by it. Right. So she's from from Perley. She's right. very middle class. Has no understanding of. Half the things I said, the first year we were together, she was like, why do you do that? Why what, do you What's Pearly got to do with it? I went to school in Pearly, so what because are you trying to Because it's a nice part of the world. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Pearly is a lovely part of the world. It's very, very far, but it's a nice <laughs> part of the world. But um, no, what, the reason I say that is because, so we have a christening, right. everyone gets drunk. Right. We go to a wedding, everyone gets drunk, yeah. where she's very much, well, no, we're, we're there for the christening, yeah. right? And for uh, Christianity yeah. or whatever you go yeah. for. Where I'm from, everyone's like, let's get the christening thing out of the way, and then it's a three hour piss up afterwards. Right. And that's British culture sometimes, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and, and that's But as a professional sportsman. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not from correlate? it though, am I? No. I didn't go through the system. I was right. never, and this is the thing as well. Every single time I did well on the field, there was so much uh, carnage off the field. Right. It was like, well, that can't be wrong because on the pitch it's going right. Do you get what I mean? I yeah, was yeah. always being rewarded yeah. for my stupid yeah, yeah. behaviour. Yeah, yeah. And so I never really had that balance to look around at it. And also, as you know, owners and, and managers, if you're doing well, it's all right. We'll yeah. let that one slide. We'll give that we'll, a pass. Yeah. 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 And, and I did well for 10 years. And then you turn around and go, actually, what have I got to show for it? Mm. Yes, I've got the, the, the material yeah. things, yeah. but I'm not very happy. My kids don't think I'm a great person. Right. A lot of people around me are actually scared of me to tell me the truth. Right. Because whether I'll cut off them financially or right. whether I'll jump jump off the. And you have, have a an fight. entourage around you? Do you think at the time? No, I've got the same five friends with me right. now, but we're all coming up in it together. Right. So we're all making mistakes. We're all okay. And probably when they were telling me, I was so. Well, you can't tell me that I'm, I'm captain of the Premier League. Yeah. And yeah, I hear what you say, but I'm still going to go and order two more bottles in the club. And it's four o'clock. So this epiphany you're saying, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to operate in this fashion. Yeah. Five years ago. Yeah. What was the catalyst for it? My my new partner. I hate giving her credit because you know I'll uh I'll <laughs> let lay it down for the next two years. But she first time we met was in was in a Nando's. We just had a chat, just the two of us. We said spent six hours so together. You were treating her then, were you? She treated me, <laughs> and, that's, okay. and that's what it was. It was very much. She worked in South Bank, right? And it was I don't. Give a shit about your money. Yeah. I don't give a shit what you've got and yeah. all of that. If you want to meet me, I'll be in this Nando's at five o'clock. Turned up and we spent till just before half ten when it closed there. And it was just she had she's the first person I've ever met that had it her life figured out. Right. She hadn't done it at this point, but it was by the time I'm 30, I'm gonna do this. Yeah. What I require from my partner is this. this yeah. What do you require from me? Uh, 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 um Right, okay. I don't know. Yeah. What I don't we just go out, don't we? Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. You want to get with me? It's this, it's this, it's this. And she doesn't budge on it. Yeah. And it was the first time somebody had ever, from the start, gone, this is forget the football, is, yeah. Yeah. forget all of that. And maturity. And it's, it's a maturity, And she it? was 25 at the time. Your journey into being a footballer. <laughs> I mean, what do you think you gained or perhaps missed out on by not playing in academies and not going through that development process? I mean, Oof. you've gone from being to school to being a bricklayer. Do you look at that and go, well, that benefited me actually, because it gave me substance 
or or do you wish maybe that like a lot of boxers have a background when if they haven't had a lot of um, amateur fights when they when go to the pro to game level. like uh, Anthony Joshua yeah, I yeah. think you know people criticise his performances but don't look at the fact he didn't have a big ad a big amateur career. But I do, also do you think it hurt you? Definitely, and I think also yes, while well, it's good on the on the way up, technically I was behind everybody. Yeah, I had to work harder in terms of the technical aspect, right. the understanding of the game. But when you're first landing, oh, when I first landed, into football. Oh. And you're and you're going on that journey of being around other players that have been through academies. There's probably yeah. a bit of cliqueiness about it. I was at, I was in League Two, so that helped a little bit. Yeah. So I was at Warsaw. Warsaw, yeah. But if I paint a picture, imagine me walking in an Adidas tracksuit. I'm like eleven stone wet with a massive head. That's all I can tell you. Like, <laughs> I looked pathetic, and a pair of football dirty football boots that I played in on a Sunday before, in an Asda, in an Asda bag, right? Turn it up into a League Two team where all of the, what would be considered the reserves then, have all played a first team game. They're all bouncing between, all the under 16s, 17s, 18s are in with the, with the reserve team. And then this kid com comes in and it's like, wow, that kid there's got a Louis Vuitton bag. That kid there's got a Gucci. I didn't know what any of these things were at that yeah, point. And I've got an Asda carry bag, yeah. Yeah, and I've just been dropped off by my old football manager, just dropped me off and gave me 20 quid to get home. Right. So. It was like, okay, let's figure this out. Um, and the way that Wars used to do it, the old um, manager, Mick Housel, used to make yep. us run to training. Right. So it was a mile run from the, we got trained at the stadium and the old training ground was a mile away. And you had to beat him there. So he's going to load the van up and he's going to drive down. So we had to, and whatever time you decided to let set off, you just had to be there before him. Okay, follow the lads down, we run down. Get there, now, now what do we do? Put your boots on, oh, okay, okay. Follow him, follow him, follow him. Half 12, back, eat. They're all going. Where are you going now? Oh, we're finished. I've just finished on, on a building site. I started, yeah. at, I started at 5 a.m. Yeah. Right. Probably get home at 8 p.m. Which, what, well, what do you do for the rest of the day? Chill out, play PlayStation. I've looked at my life. My mum's at work. My, my brother's at um, Villa at the time. My sister's at, at school. Well, I might as well stay here, try to get better then. That's what I was going to ask you. Did yeah. you then utilise that time? Yeah, and yeah. Mick was, Mick, I'll always give Mick a credit. He used to just say things to me like, even when I got into the first team and I started playing, fucking how you going home now? Oh, you've changed you. All right then. And then he, just, he I remember the best one he ever got me with, because I was on trial. Uh, I had no job and I was on trial for three months at, at, at Warsaw. And he went, Troy, I've, uh, I've left you a bag of balls on the Astro. and just carried on walking. Now, what he said in the hindsight was, you either go and pick them balls up and bring them back in and go home, or there's a bag of balls up there, you're going to go and do some work. I'll go and do some work. Mm. And I used to stay up there all the time. I couldn't kick the ball. I can't kick the ball great with my left foot now, but I couldn't kick it when I got there. So he used to stay outside with me and let's work with the outside of the right. I, I actually went in at Warsaw as a midfielder. Yeah. So my whole career was meant to be a midfielder. Then Warsaw made me start lifting weights and went, actually, do you know what? He's a big lad, him. Let's throw him up front. League two, bulky, whatever. Was it a period of time of great excitement for you? And did you did you see it as a real opportunity? Were you suddenly thinking, I'm a professional footballer. I'm on the cusp of being a, a professional footballer. But do you know what it was? It was, wow, I get paid to do this. Yeah. Even when I signed my pro, I was on £100 a week. It wasn't right. matching up to my building one, no. but I could do this for a living. Right. <sighs> let's, let's do it. And I always had this... Um, what do they call it? That feel when you don't think you're supposed to be there, it's gone out of my mind. The oh, word. imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Yeah. Because I was like, well, this is going to end soon. Yeah. So I always used to speak to the old bricky, like, when this is over, yeah. can I come back? Can I come back? When can yeah. I come back? Yeah, there'll be a job here if you don't always try. And then I went on loads of Hales Owen and I was doing what I was doing there and I did all right. And uh, I remember the very last game at Hales Owen. And obviously they know better. And as you, as a young person, you don't really know too much in football. It's all being spoken around you. But I was leaving Hales Owen on my last game to go sign my pro right. at, at Warsaw. But on that last game, I just scored two and, and I knew my little youth loan had ended. And the manager, Martin Taylor at the time, I was like, uh, Martin, can, you know, if this doesn't work out, can I sign here? Because they were paying their players 50 pound a week, but it was cash in hand. And they were getting goal bonuses. So I was like, well, I could just keep scoring here. I'll make 150 quid. I'll be all right. And he was just like, he, I, I said it uh, before, he was like, you have no fucking idea what's coming your way, do you? Please don't ever forget that. I was like, oh, okay. Went back, signed my pro. And then just build on and build on. And it's always one of those things, because 
I was doing well. I got into Warsaw first team. They got promo they won League Two. And my first game was Torquay away. And I came on for eight minutes. And the manager, very old and tired, Rich Richard Money, I don't know if you've ever had a deal with yeah, Richard Money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rich, lovely fella, I love him to death. But he he said to me, and I thought this was gospel, if you don't if you stop fucking running, you'll never play for me again. But all he was saying was work the back line. Yeah. I took that as literal. Yeah. So even when the ball went out for throw-ins, I'm running. You're running. I'm just running back. <laughs> yeah, do you want me here? Here's all right. I'm running over there. I never played, only played like eight minutes of that season. But we got promoted and he, he just said to me, no matter what task we set you, you always do it and you'll do it even more than it was supposed to be done. But how does that chime with stories of not turning up for trials at Villa? Mm -hmm. Needing Mick to drag your ass out of bed and stick you in a taxi yep. to get you to to go for your trial at Warsaw. How does that all chime? I need to see. I need to feel it. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? If someone says to you, "If you work hard, you will get this," how? I don't. No one so around me. Well, so once you've visualised it, or yeah. you've actually you've got it in your mind's eye, and you can see what it is. Yeah. Boom! You grab it's it. It's done. You grab it. Before first, yeah. before going to Warsaw, I was I was like sixth pick in my team. In right. Everyone around me, no, they're all better footballers than me. Why? Technically, are, technically, yeah. and or even technically for that team, yeah, they're, they're they're older, they're what they're more faster, whatever it might be, they are considered better than me at that moment in time. So, none of them have been picked up by these big teams. The highest someone around my area had ever got to was Hales Owen, and he only lasted two weeks because he ended up fighting with the the, the uh, one of the players and they kicked him out. So. When you were saying like going into the league and doing it professionally, that that's not achievable until I got there. Yeah, and then you can. And see then it. it was like, oh, and then it's an opportunity. Now it's an opportunity. And then you're going to grab it. And if you're yeah. not good enough, it's not going to be for the will of not working. Yeah. And also, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Fear and embarrassment. When I started at Warsaw, John Whitney, he's at Aston Villa now. He's a he was a monster. He was he was like a proper fitness guy. Right. He had a hole in his knee. His knee used to leak pus. And he used to do like weird stuff and like lick it and go, ah, oh, let's go. He's a very old school. Lovely. League two. <laughs> he's not like that anymore, but he's very League two old British humor. Right. And he gave me a, a set of eight kilos. He's like, right, we're going to do this. And I was like, one was going up, one was down. He's like, have you ever lifted a weight before? I was like, nope. Fucking hell, what are we going to do? Can you do a press up? I could do press ups because I used to do boxing. Uh, right, get you on the squat rack. I'm, like my head's coming forward, and he's like, "Lads!" But now, right, now it would be okay. We're gonna drop the weight and sort it out. Lads, get on him, get on him. So I've got all the first team coming in now. Troy, do that squat again, and I'm embarrassed. And it's like, oh, okay, I remember you doing that. No problem. They go off. Dad, how do how do you lift weights? Did it start lifting? Start lifting. By the end of that season, I'm the, I'm lifting the most. Joe. John, do you want me to? And that's what I said to him. John, do you want me to do it for the lads again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you'll do all right, me son. And that's what it was. When you leave Warsaw, you don't seem to behave the best way. Given nope. what I'm listening to about your attitude, your disposition, mm -hmm. your grabbing of opportunities. But here you are before going to Watford, whether it's because you can't get what you want or you're trying to engineer a move, refusing to do certain things and not being prepared to train and not being prepared to get involved in in whatever it was mm -hmm. that you required of you because you're having a tantrum about wanting to leave a football club. Hindsight's obviously a wonderful thing, but at the time, advisors, this is what you'd, I'm being told, I'm, I'm not even going to be back for pre-season. Yeah. But then it's, it's dragging up. I think there was three bids, for a bid coming, a bid coming, a bid coming. And it was very weird because I'm, again, I'm not in that, that realm. I'm 20, just about, to, 21, yeah, 21. And at this point, I'm at my height of my career with Warsaw, and in the grand total of 300 pounds a week. Yeah. Including bonuses. Yeah. So, and there they've gone, by the way, you come to Watford, five grand. Yeah. Fuck, oh, Jesus Christ, okay. So the first two weeks of it, I train like normal. About a week, 10 days before the season starts, um, Watford have said, this is the last, the last bid that's going in. Now again, hindsight, we all know that's mm. never the case, mm. but I'm, what do you mean? Your, the offer they gave me was 800 pounds, was the max that Warsaw could pay me at that time. And there's five grand on the table. Why, oh, so why got, aren't you letting me go? Yeah, so you've got FOMO kicking in. Yeah, 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 and then also now the agent in the background is, I need you kicking balls yeah. away, doing this, doing that. Don't you do anything? And I did it because 
well, fundamentally, I got what I wanted in the end. But in hindsight, it was like, well, actually, I probably should have just been, they're going to figure it out either way. Yeah. I was doing well. There was other clubs in for me, yeah. but I didn't know the business at that yeah. point. I didn't know what football business looked like. And thankfully, every time I've gone back to Warsaw afterwards, they it's understand. It's been forgotten. Yeah. yeah, and I was, like I said, I was, I was 21. They, they understood I was a kid. What do you think of, um, I mean, that kind of advice to me, mm. I mean, it's easy for me to say because I'm a club owner, right? So I've got, I come from a different perspective, right? And I'm also a grown up, so I understand that in sometimes in life, you have to make it clear to people that you want to go. Mm -hmm. right, I've done my job, I've been here for a period of time, be fair with me and I'll be fair with but you. But that was the thing as well. Warsaw did yeah. say they were going to sell me because right. they were a selling club. Right. So I won player of the year, player's player, top goal scorer the year before. So at the awards dinner, it was like, it was my farewell, really. What do you think of agents? I mean, I dislike mm -hmm. them intensely, but you guys, <laughs> you guys use them. You hide behind them as footballers because you don't want to impart the bad news yourselves. I, you, but I, you always I, know what I, you want. Yeah. You get an agent to go and do it and get everyone else to pay for it. I, but, I think, I think differently to that. Do you? I've always seen the agent as very much as if I'm getting a mortgage. So when I want to get a mortgage for a house, I go and see somebody that knows that and yeah. gets in. So and you pay him. Pardon? And you pay him. Yeah, and I pay for that service. You don't pay for your agent, so do I you? Do. Yeah, I do. How so? I paid a 5%. Yeah, by getting the club to jack up your wages. Yeah, but you still pay your, your tax on top of that. You still pay all of that. Come on. What you do is you price it into your thinking. And you go, right, if I've got Troy mm -hmm. Deeney right, and I want to sign you, right, and I'm prepared to pay £10,000 a week. Yeah. You know, yeah. just go back to yeah, old, old money for the purpose of this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Right? Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Right? And I'm prepared to pay ten grand a week. And mm -hmm. your agent rocks in and tells me I've got to pay 15 grand a week or the deal doesn't happen. Yes. And then on top of that, it's not really fair for you to have to bear the cost of that. So we're going to need to see a little bit of an uplift on that because you've got to get my fees into the equation. Yeah. That ain't I, you paying for it. That's me paying for it. But then am I not paying for the service? Because But if you, you go and you, buy a house, to use your example, when you've got an estate agent, you've had your money, you've got paid your taxes, and you pay the estate agent for buying for selling your house. But I'm also not going to pay... If it's let's say again, keep it simple. The number's three hundred thousand for a house. I'm not trying to play the three hundred thousand. I want to try to bring it down a little bit. So you've coming in with a, a, a sure. fit, a ten thousand. Sure. You know you probably could go up to fifteen. But Fine. It's, it's a ballpark. But, but then, and the reason why I've gone up to fifteen mm. is because your agent's got you what you want. Yeah. All right. So on that it's, basis, it's, it's why a, am I then paying him on top to be? Able I, to, I agree. And that's I agree the, with that point. And that's I the point. And that's that where part. you guys irritate me because you get away <laughs> with murder. No, of course. The reasons why I linked it to the agents was because. You were being told by advisors mm -hmm. to kick up, yeah, and to be difficult and truculent and belligerent, mm -hmm. right? And I just wondered if it made you think well of agents because the reasons why the agent wanted you to do that is because he wants the move, of course. And if he gets and we, we, by getting the move, he gets paid, of course. And then that's what I mean in hindsight. Yes, you could look at that, yeah. but at that time, he absolutely transformed my whole family's life, right? So I can't see. No, I can't see the bad. I can't see the negative of that. I, I could it. only see, yeah. well, he said do this. It worked. I didn't physically harm anyone. I didn't. Yes, I was disruptive, but I was still, I was still there. And Warsaw got paid. I got paid. The agent gets paid. Yeah. Everyone's happy. You went to Watford, and I want to talk to what, about Watford in in, a, in isolation. Of course. But going to Watford with some of the dispositions that you had, because obviously you've, you're, you're drinking at that time. And yeah. You, and, and it looks like you were gambling as well. Yep. You play. You played under Malky Mackay, yep. who I know. Daichi, of course, I know. Yep. Uh, John Franco Zola, I've come across. How much did you grow up as a footballer under these managers? Because I know there's mm. been some some strong experiences that you have with yeah, people like definitely. Sean Daichi, and I like I, Sean. I, 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 I like Sean. Sean. Yeah, he's yeah. he's like you know you get that stupid question: Who's your best manager? Yeah, but you can't pick a best manager because they're all different. They all had something different, don't they? But it was also. The, you can pick your worst ones, though, can't you? Yeah, oh, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. But you, but there's there's people at, at times that I needed in a very selfish manner. So Malky did his best for me, and I, I've always said it, I let him down massively, and I've spoke to him and apologised. And in what know, way? At Watford for that season, his budget was one million pounds. Yeah, he spent half of that on me. Yeah, and I come big time, Charlie. I've just come out this little, wasn't even a pond. It was a puddle. Yeah, at Warsaw, I signed on. The very first game of the season. Right. That first game, Marvin Sordell and uh, Daddy Graham mm -hmm. played Norwich. Mm -hmm. Marvin plays really well as an assist. Daddy scores two. John Eustace scores the captain. But I landed at, at Norwich in the hotel. Like, you know, after pre-match, that little bit where people are getting changed to go down for the meeting. 
that's when I got to Watford. That was my introduction. So I came in and it was like, I was trying to catch up, trying to find my feet. And Malky was trying his best, trying his best. But then the second game, Carabao Cup, Marvin scores two. Now in hindsight, okay, it's brilliant for me because now I should really be able to adjust and find my way into the team. But I've just been coming from Warsaw where I played. Even if I was crap, I played 95 mm -hmm. minutes. And I've got these two lads in front of me. And with the greatest respect, they're technically better and they, they had good careers themselves. But I'm Troy at this point. I've got this massive ego, overinflated ego. I should be playing. You told me when, again, goes back to that. You told me when I was signing, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be playing. You gave yeah. me the number nine, why aren't I playing? Yeah, and then alongside having more money than I've ever had in, in my life and my family dynamic changing. And that's something that I think you could appreciate as well with a lot of young players, their family dynamic changes like that Yeah. when 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 monetary yeah. value comes into of it. Of course. And I went from being Troy, the the, the son, the grandparent, to, to the provider. head of the family. Yeah. And everyone was like, Troy, you got 50 quid, Troy, you got 100 quid, whatever yeah. it might be. So Malky was good and I let him down. And that first year was an absolute writer. The second year, Daishi takes over, but Daishi was Malky's assistant. So if anybody spent more time Were trying you? to get yeah. me yeah. to not be a, a knobhead, it was Daishi. <laughs> And I used to be like, oh, fuck off, mate. And, you know, just just cheeky and, yeah. and juvenile. And he took over. And I remember the day they said he took over. And I was like, oh, that's it. The football dream's over. Because mm. he's not having me one bit. And I spoke to Adrian Mariapa. And this is why Maps is, like, not my football, but a, a genuine friend. And uh, he was like, look, he is going to fucking test you yeah. this whole preseason. Stop the drinking. Don't drink for six weeks. And I'll stay with you in every run. Because Maps is fit, was fitter than me, and it's probably still is fitter than me. But he was like, I'll stay with you in every run. Just don't quit. If you don't quit, it'll come around to you. Because under Malky as well, I think it's fair. I didn't go in every Monday. Every Monday a cat died or something. Like, I was just, I got pissed on a Saturday or Sunday. I'll, right. I'll sleep it off. And then I'll come in Tuesday. I'll train really well. I'll go out Tuesday night because we had Wednesday off. Um, so, yeah, I let him, I, the dice you do it, he, he's... He's wise, he knows the score. Mm. So all through preseason, he's battering me, battering me. You're gonna quit, you're gonna quit. He's trying to sell me as well. But we had, I've spoke, told you story, but we went to France and we did this. He has it, he still does it to this day. If you remember when he signed at Everton, mm -hmm. do you remember everyone was like, he's got the shin pads out. So yeah. you, you train the way you play yeah. under Shaw, which I think he's absolutely right. Yeah, I agree, I with, agree that with that. Yeah. Neil Warnock has the same philosophy. Yeah, yeah. and then he, um, he has this day, which is called, the short day, the gaffer's day. There's no GPS. I, I don't think he did it at, at Everton, but he definitely had the running show. But he has there's no GPS. None of the um, fitness guys can get involved. It's him versus him with the players. And we went on, and we would have been the first people to do. It. We went on the beach in, in, in France. It was raining. It was horrible. And we're running, and he's at the front. To be fair to him, just jogging, keeping the pace. We get to, I don't know, uh, a bank. Right, sprints. Sprint, sprint, sprint. He did this for two hours. We come back to the hotel. Every time we're like, I think I'm going to quit maps. Shut up. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Get back to the hotel car park. There's a fucking hit CrossFit hit session set up in the car park. Right, get that done. And then he's over me. I'm doing press-ups. I've got snot coming out. You're going to quit now, aren't you, Troy? Time to go in. Do you want another drink? I'm like, maps, I'm going to fucking hit him with a dumbbell in a minute. No, shut up, shut up. Then we did two hours, 45 minutes. I'm like, oh my God, we can't do anymore. Back on the beach. Oh my God, that's it, Maps. I've literally got like, you know, that angry tear. I'm, I'm going to quit. This This isn't for me. This isn't football. Troy, fucking wild well on everyone in the water. That was uh, that was our rest and done. But yeah. then after that, he respected me. Yeah. Because I didn't quit. Yeah. Every every gaffer's day that we did, we did four of them throughout preseason. I never quit. I didn't, didn't win them, but I never quit. And I did actually play for him until January. I never started as his main striker until January. And then, but you know what was brilliant about it? In true Troy fashion, I in, I played Millwall away. I, it's the first game. He puts me and Joe Garner up front because we sold Marvin Sordell to Bolton for about three million quid or whatever on the, on the day. Marvin was starting. I was on the bench. Marvin was sold while we did the team meeting right. at the hotel before we left. Right. So it was like, Troy, you're in. Chance, your chance to go do it. I, I score, me and Joe both score. I go on a run then, I score uh, 12 goals between then and the end of the season. That was in January. In February, I get into the incident that I did. Right. Because now, yeah, I'm scoring again and I'm in front, so the beer start flowing yeah. again. And You're out of contract now with Birmingham. Yep. Today. 
officially today. Yeah, yeah. June thirtieth. Yeah. So you're now a free agent. Yeah. What does that look like for you? It's a wonderful place to be in because everyone is already dictating what I should do. So if you ask somebody now, oh, he's already gone into the media, isn't he? He's already right. got that sorted. I've just I've done my A license. I've got all of my coaching yeah. badges. I was going into coaching, isn't he? Well no done. one's actually going. What's Troy? Other than you now. Yeah. What's Troy? What? Yeah. And I'm going to still play. I yeah. played 30 games in the in the championship yeah. last year. Great. It scored seven goals. Not ideal, but look at the team. And this isn't a, an excuse. It's a, it's a valid excuse. Our top goal scorer had 10 in Scotty Hogan. Right. The team when we started the season, the objective was to stay up. Because we'd been written off by every single person at Birmingham City for all of the trials and tribulations off the pitch, we were going to finish rock bottom. Mm. We finished with two, three, four weeks to go, safe at 17th. Now, what I'm used to, that isn't considered success, but in its entirety, it yeah, was success. It's relative. And I was a, I was a, I was a big part of So what of that. does it look like for you now? I mean, what are you going to do? I've got, You're going I've to got play. offers. I've right. got offers, yeah. I'm going to play. In this country? Yeah. In a comparable league? Yeah. Who? <laughs> Not going to tell me. Never going to tell you. Right. Um, but I've got offers from abroad. But again, even that, there's one I can say. I got an offer to go to Australia, to go to okay. Melbourne Victory. Now, looking at it, lovely, lovely part of the world, yeah, blah, 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 it. all of that. But you're done. Yeah. You're done then. Football's done. Right. I don't think you can go there for two years, play, come back. I could be wrong. Come yeah. back and have any sort of relevance here. To where, even if you want to do coaching afterwards, I don't think you really? can. I don't think so. No, so I think you have to start. So you again. wouldn't go to Saudi if someone or someone comes across to you and goes. No, I did say Saudi right. because we all like money. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> it's a different. Yeah. But Let's keep it real. Saudi, I think, is a very interesting take. Three or four years ago, I did have an offer to go there for, yeah. for a, a substantial amount of money, as you can imagine. I think it's moved on now. What money wise? No, yeah, money wise, but I think look at all the players that are going, yeah. what they're trying to achieve. I think you have a template in Live Golf where you can go, okay, you're still very, very attractive. It's not just a. I think when people started going to America, we, we knew they were done. Yeah. When people started going to China, it was like, oh, maybe the money's too good to turn well, out. Oscar, Oscar was a different one when he, cause he yeah. went there at 26, didn't yeah. he? And, and, then, ne and Nevers going to Saudi Arabia now makes a different play, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. And, yeah. and I think. Benzema's still good enough. If yeah. he was available for the same money, yeah. there'd be an awful lot of Premier League yeah, teams yeah. trying to take yeah. it. So I think you've got loads of players who are in that that peak that try to raise the standard. So I think, yeah, that that'd be something I'd be I'd be interested in. But playing is playing your focus. focus. Hundred percent. You're gonna play. Yeah. yeah. What what what's the point? Let's move into a slightly traumatic period. I mean, you've had enough of them, but this is one. <laughs> this is one that um, is. Um, something that no one would want to go through if they had any any sort of rational mm -hmm. thinking and it was somebody somebody in my family somebody quite close in my family went to prison mm -hmm. um and um they talked about it changing their life it's mm -hmm. not something they were proud of and not something no. i'm proud of for them mm -hmm. right but you 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 went into prison in, for two years it was a 10 month sentence yeah i ended up doing three months and three months on tech right um with a suspended two years if any kind of infringements ever happened again. The 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 long and short of it is I I talk about the incident because I feel you I have to because it's part of my journey, yeah. part of my story. But I am also always conscious and, and I I hope you don't mind me using the platform say there was a victim on the end of it and a family on the end of yeah. it. And I don't ever want it to come across that I am glamorizing it or yeah. anything of that nature. So I just wanted to just just get that in because I feel like if that was my kid, I'd be absolutely fuming that there's somebody yeah. talking about it yeah. and he's being considered. Lionized. Yeah, considered yeah. considered great, I think, yeah. sometimes. Yeah, I'm um, not framing it that way. No, though. no, but no, I'm just I'm, saying no, for I'm any. I'm, I'm, I'm being blunt with you about yeah. it and you're being honest about your views on it. Yeah. And if you've reached a point or, or reached a point at the time that you realise that there was someone on the receiving end of it. And, I and ultimately, guilty you're a high profile footballer and people are going to say, well done you for coming out of prison and surviving and making a success of your life. And the mm. person that got the kick up the arse and all the trouble that they had as yeah. a result of their interaction with you is sitting there thinking, well, who was the victim yeah. in this? Exactly. You yeah, know, I, I, I get yeah. that. You, you described it as the worst experience, mm. but the best thing that's happened to you. Yeah. I, I think I know what that means, but mm. I want you to tell me what it meant to you. The night of that incident was the day I found out my dad was dying. Yep. So, again, not trying to make any excuses. Say the heads would have said, stay in, have a cry, have a few sherbets in the house. Younger Troy, I'm going out, I'm going to get bladdered, I'm going to forget about the world. 
And everyone knows, because I've said it so many times, bury my, da my dad on the Friday, yep. go to jail on the Monday. Yeah. So I am mentally not in a space. Yeah. Of, just I'm, I'm, just survi I'm just surviving yeah. at this yeah. point. I'm just getting through it. And then obviously you go to a jail. I didn't, I didn't go into a, a soft jail to start with. I was in a proper jail and, you know, people let me know that I was a, I was an idiot. What was the club's reaction to you? I, I'm the, the most luckiest man alive because Lawrence was selling the Selling it to Gina at the right. time. So in that spell from the season ending, me going to jail and the season re-picking up where Gino Pozzo and the Pozzo Valley bought the club and all of the players, if you remember, 46 players came in in that mm. summer. Nobody looked and went, where's the number nine? Right. Because there's just so much to yeah. go on in terms of training ground. All of, you know all of the yeah, infrastructure yeah, yeah, that yeah. happens. Uh, and by the time they'd got round to saying, well, who's that number nine? Because Mat Matty Vidro wanted number nine. Yeah. And he went, well, who is that? Oh, he's in jail, but he'll be home in two weeks. Yeah. And it kind of got to that point where it's like, well, let's just let's just see if we can get some money back for him, mm. kind of thing. Um, but yeah, in terms of the experience, it was it was awful because I needed to figure out who I am. I realized that financially I had nothing behind me. Um, about ten grand's worth of savings and mm a shitty car to, to show for it in, in, in the area that I was from. And then, yeah, you know, makes you grow up. But the best thing that happened was I had to go to therapy. That was part of my, one of my conditions. Right. And that got me into the space of talking. What about, kind of therapy? Uh, at the time, it was drug and alcohol abuse. Right. Because that was part of my um, my stipulations to come out on tag. I had to do right. five hours worth of that. But it also got me understanding and thinking myself. And it also made me stop. One thing that anybody, and I'm sure your your family would have said if you asked him, you've got nothing but time in jail. Yeah. So to reflect. Yeah, and you're, you're I'm sat there for the first couple of days was like 22 hours in this cell with a fella I don't know. Run the bunk bed, the the, the shitters there. Yeah. Like all my ego and all of the yeah. the, the 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 gravitas of what being a footballer was is absolutely been stripped away. away. Yeah, yeah. And it's like. Is, is this what it is? And there's a reality that hit you. Thankfully, that hit me. And thankfully, even more, I was able to start taking that in. And um, yeah, it just I just said this will never happen again. And everything I always said that my dad had did to me, it, uh, yes, he was physical, but he left me so many times going in and out of jail that I had to grow up on my own. Yeah. Well, I've just left my two-year-old son there. So I'm mm. no better than the man I was saying did all this to me because I'm doing it to him. What was it like in prison? I mean. Your father had a reputation, yes, which probably preceded you. Yeah, um, when you go in there, yes, sir. You have, you're a footballer, mm -hmm. so that comes with a with a, at that time comes with celebrity attached to it. Um, yeah, not the right celebrity though. No, yeah, granted, yeah. but it's still there in people's yeah, yeah, minds, yeah, of course. and a culture of people in prison that that will be envious of that, mm -hmm. including probably I suspect the prison guards. Yes, sir. What kind of life was that like? Did it make you a target? <laughs> Again, go back to what I said earlier, yes and no. Because I had a lot of friends in there. Where I'm from, someone goes to jail for two years and comes back and does exactly the same. It's kind of like Simon went to jail today. I did it, that's a shame. How long did he get? Four years. Okay. Anyway, we're getting uh we're gonna go to the pub or we're gonna watch the game. It's that it's yeah. just so turnaroundish that it doesn't really become a big thing. Right. I get sentenced, I go downstairs, but then you're waiting for all of all of that van to fill up. So I was case one. Yeah. There was five more cases. So I'm downstairs for a long time. Then I got off in the van. When I get there, again, take all your suit off, give all that in, but blah, blah, blah. The guy behind it's like, Deanie, Deanie, Deanie. Because my dad didn't want us to have his last name because of his reputation. Right. My dad's last name is Burke. He said, Deanie, 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 Deanie. Are you Burke, your son? I'm going, yeah. Well, you're going to be fucking trouble then, aren't you? Stamp, go. Right. What, what, what kind of trouble? I, I don't know. My dad kept us away from all that. What what am I walking into? Shoved into this cell. You're in there for the night. It's like an overnight thing. Okay, come out the next morning. Gives me this folder of stuff, my paperwork and these bed, bed sheets and stuff. You're in cell nine. Go down there. As he opens the door. Oh, by the way, they've all just got the paper. They know who you are. Yeah. Bang. Shuts the door. Who? What? What was said in the paper? Mm. I don't know. And as soon as I'm walking through, it's like, what a fucking dickhead. You can hear them. They're not whispering. What a fucking dickhead he is being in here with us. What this and what that. 
oh, this is going to be a tough time, this. So just try to keep your head down and try to get through. And thankfully, I got, I did get through. I did, I did uh, two weeks in Winston Green Jail, which is the, the main jail in Birmingham. Wasn't a pleasant experience. And then I went, this was the worst part because I didn't know you could just get moved. So I'm in my cell, got into my little bit of a routine. Now Jeremy Kyle's coming on, I'm, I'm having a look. And Troy, you go in. Where? Pack your stuff. Pack your stuff, go. Get in this van. Have a little sleep in the van. Wake up. I'm in Warrington. I've never been to Warrington. Where, where am I? Oh, up north. And now there's Manx this side, the Scousers that side. And all my friends that people I knew around here, they was all gone. Now it's just me. Oh, this could, this could get sticky now then. So again, look after yourself. Now go to self-isolation and... It was just a case of survival, survival. But I did say to myself, this will never happen again. Did it make you stronger, do you think? Because, and I listened to that story and I think it must be so debilitating. It's a mm -hmm. consequence of your own behaviour. So you reap yeah. the whirlwind, right? But me most people can't. Most people suffer from the fact that it's not their fault and ultimately someone else is doing something to them. Mm -hmm. I'm did good it... at that though, Simon. Sorry to cut you. I'm good at that. Right. So like me not having a club now, probably my fault. Right. Did do as good as I should have done last year. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, Taking account of it. Yeah. Mm. Do I do I blame all of it on myself? No, because you have to just give and take in life in any way. But the real core truths of it, the core values of it, if I got injured, what did I do wrong? You, you feel any trepidation when you come out back going back into football? Because obviously when you get people coming back in, Marlon King came out yeah. and he got a rash. Yes. Um, then you got, obviously for different reasons, Chad yeah. Evans and other people yeah. for different reasons. But they were there, you know, Adam yeah. Johnson, which was a slightly more s yes. significant societal challenge for people yes. to accept. 100%. Football fans just go after you. Yeah. And that's a that's a way to diminish you. It's a way to ridicule, to put you off your game and to, to generally upset you. Yeah. Did you... Did, did I, you... I became... I had this, like, iron cast, though, when I came out around my mind. Whether that be, again, fear, ego, whatever, but I'm going to make this the best version it, it can be. And if you look back at my career post then, I, uh, I'd, never had, I'd never scored 20 goals before that situation in a season. That year I come out 20, the year yeah. after 25, the year after 21, promotion. Also by the second year I'm captain because now it's, again, I was on tag. So yeah. with the reflection, se seven till seven, I had to leave the house in Birmingham at seven to get to Watford. I got in for about half eight-ish. Bang, let's do a gym session now. And Zola was the manager at the time mm. then. Me and Zola, wonderful relationship. Jeff Franco is a top, top human being. Work, work, work. If I leave at uh, 4.45, that gets me back home for seven. And all my time was spent just at football. Yeah. Just at football. Learn, learn, learn. And he used to give me DVDs to take home. But look at that. I used to watch how Jimmy used to do that. Jimmy Floyd Hasselbeck used to do this. Watch how this striker used to mm. do that. And then he, he was the first person that ever spoke to me about diet. Because the Italian football, I, did, I didn't know this at the time. I used to watch Italian football, but... They were so keen on tactics and, and dieting and, and nutrition. Why are you putting ketchup on your stuff for? Because we, that's what we do that's at home. We don't do, we? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Why are you having a bacon sarni before? That's what we do at home. No, no, no. Do this, do that. Mm -hmm. And everything just... I think Daishi made me a man. Jeb Franco made me a player. So a slight change of gear, yes, um, Troy, in terms of the subject matter. And a subject that... Um, I think we might differ on, and I think yes, there was a, um, a scenario when uh, you think, are you quite keen to take me to task on one of the other <laughs> platforms about the issues around BLM yeah. and activism and, 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 and the challenge of racism in sports? Yeah. And I know that you were very much at the fore mm -hmm. of having strong opinions about some of the societal stuff that was going on yeah. with the taking of the knee. It's interesting because in all conversation, in all arguments, there's always got to be there's a little bit of where I might actually hear some some things of what you say and go, actually, yeah, yeah, I like that. But I think where where it got to, um, around around that time anyway, you talk about race and we talk about COVID, yeah. it became very here or here with the two positions. Yeah. You and couldn't meet in the middle. You yeah. couldn't have a conversation. Yeah. So the reason the, uh, the Premier League meeting was so important was because while we was talking about how we were going to transition and come back into football, so I'm sorry, I know you asked me about Black Lives Matter, but yeah, I we'll think the COVID to... thing yeah, kind yeah, of comes yeah, into yeah, it as yeah. well. Because I was critical of you in that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I criticised you. A, a yeah. few yeah. people were, and, and yeah. I hope when I tell you why, you'll understand my position. Yeah. Someone was born with a hole in his heart yeah. and breathing difficulties. It was, if you remember, anyone with breathing difficulties, mm. this is who you're, you're more higher risk, blah, blah, blah. 
and my partner and so she won't mind she she had cancer before as well right so my home became absolutely fort knox in terms of doing everything that we were supposed to have done at yeah. that time look I've, I've got these to look after and if i have to quit because of this no problem i'll quit in that same time george floyd situation happens so we had the first meeting about covid i've said i'm not going back to work wish you lot all well we get to about meeting six, where it's progressed. Is Please it go. the meeting with the Premier League captains, yes. right? No, with right. the Premier League. So the Premier League, I will give them credit, were very inclusive. Yeah. Everyone has their say. But as we were getting back to, we're already back playing now, now we're going to transition into these kind of games. Two weeks before was, look, F1's made a stance, NBA's made a stance, we are going to make a stance. That yeah. was the Premier League's position. Did you think they needed to do a gesture? I mean, I, it's... I felt like we did at the time. Why? Everyone else in sport was. So we, we should have. There was also the the, the things happening in London, the, the, the marches and things yeah. like that yeah. uh, from, from both sides. And it was just like, what are those when you're like, is this not, I just looked at it logically, is this not the most per, like prevalent time where we could get something done? And my bigger thing about getting it done and, and we'll go to take, like taking the knee, for yeah. example, people argue it's lost its relevance. I would say from the conversations that I was directly involved in, it didn't, it forced the Premier League to have a conversation about legislation simply as, if if you racially abuse me on a football pitch now, mm -hmm. what is the what is the fine, what is the... What is the response? response? There still isn't one. But there is, isn't there? Because we've seen it happen. We saw we saw it for Rangers when the, um, either it was at Stal Bucharest or yeah. one of the Eastern European sides. But it's not, sides. it's not set in stone. That's what I mean. It's very, it's very dependent on the situation. Right. And again, yes, there is I'm that. Not, I'm not sure that's right, Troy. I think there is a, no, a, a scale of, 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 of offences that people no, can get. From, at, yeah. that at the time of that, yeah. of when we did start yeah. taking the lead, there, there wasn't. Okay. And that, that I, know, I know there wasn't. Okay. What we have moved towards now, and you've started seeing individual uh, teams take their own stances on it. So again, I could talk to Watford and what we were doing. That was if any discrimination was happening and you was found guilty, it was stadium bans. You see... I, I, I agree that people that were making the decisions about what they wanted to do mm. were not motivated by Marxism. No. Were not motivated by defunding the police. Yeah. Right. But the underlying allegation as a result of the necessity to do it mm -hmm. is the idea that this country was institutionally racist mm -hmm. and needed to be told that by a group of footballers. Wouldn't and I think the resistance... But you've been getting told it from non-footballers for a long time. But the difference, what happens is, though, sorry, Simon, is that cool. it becomes, when it's being spoke about by footballers, it becomes so in your face and so there that you can't avoid it. We've, we've been having these discussions about education. And by the way, not we. People were a lot smarter than me. John Barge, you've chatted, been doing this for a yeah. long, long, yeah. long time. Have we moved forward? Of course we have. Your argument or your point. Yes, sir. Um is about the dissemination of information and people being very clear in their messaging. We want we're nothing to do with that political yeah. movement. But that message wasn't cutting through. This mm -hmm. isn't about the political movement, right? Mm -hmm. Yet so it wasn't cutting through in people's minds. And the yeah. me was the reasons why it wasn't cutting through, because people related that to the gesture that was adopted by the political movement. And I felt it was very unwise for you guys mm -hmm. to continue. I know what you're saying, which is how many gestures do you want to have? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I remember saying to kick it out, how useless have you got to be at this moment in time where you've got society focusing on race more than it's ever focused on right now mm -hmm. and the racial injustices that are going on that you can't cut through with your messaging. Mm -hmm. You can't cut through. You've got someone else having to do it. And then I looked at the, the, the resistance, football the sport, because the message yeah. you guys were imparting and I'll, and I'll finish and let you yeah, answer, go on, go on, please. was that I, we want to deal with racism in sports. Yeah. But I don't feel, having been a football club owner, been inside the sport, watched the progression of all ethnicities from around yeah. the world, that the sport itself mm -hmm. is rife with racism. I think society has its challenges. Mm -hmm. So why does sport because you, need to fix society's problems? Because there's always been that response, the same when, when you start saying players are role models. 
but it, but it falls into the, it falls into the same category. So players have a responsibility to go to the community and do all of these different things. I agree with the principles yeah. of if effective change needs to be yeah. had within the game yeah. to be able to make sure that when people aren't doing what they should be doing, there's consequences for it. Right? And that's, I agree that's with that. what I, all I can talk about is why I'm that's why where you're I did coming it. From. That's but, why I did and that's it. Yeah. And, and that's and that's a very different perspective yeah. with a lot of other people. And, and I can entirely relate to that. But when it comes upon the allegation, mm -hmm. because I, I I find it difficult, and it's not because I'm in any shape or form have an agenda. Of course, I, I'm about yeah. meritocracy. I don't yeah. give a shit yeah. whether you are black, brown, orange, green, purple. Yeah. You do the job, mate. In the door you come. Yes. Right. And I remember saying this to Barnsley because John said to me, "I never got a job because of my colour." And I said to him, "Did you phone me?" I watched it. Yeah. Did you phone me? He said, "No." I said, "Well, why not?" Because mm. I'd have given you an interview. It yes. might not have got you a job. Mm -hmm. So how hard did you really want to try rather than suggesting that everything is stacked up against you mm -hmm. because you're black? Now, I, I, I do recognise that there are challenges. And I do recognise in society that there are pockets of society that, that where, where the issue for me was, when the argument is put to me that the only reason for a lack of representation, say in managerial yeah. positions, is racism... I really struggle with that, Troy, because I, I don't. I, I don't. don't think, I don't disagree. I don't think the game is beset with racism. I, I don't. I don't disagree. What I think, what, well, what I know, and, and the problem is in getting into this, you, you end up talking for other people who have lived it. Do you get? What I mean? and, yeah. and I'm very conscious of not speaking their truth. The, the what I and I know because I worked with Watford directly on this. What what they implemented, and and as far as I'm aware, they're still implemented is is blind. Um, CVs, yeah. You, um, up until the final five, right. So you just no one knows male, female, and it's just who are you who's the best. But I think it's a conversation that should be had. No one should be in charge in their positions. And I learned a lot from John Barnes. I yes, didn't sir. agree with a lot of what John said, yeah. but I also read his book. I agreed with a lot of the things he said about the hierarchical structure as a result of slavery and how yeah. black people were perceived in society. I've, I've I been, got it. It was like yeah. a penny again. Yeah, I get that. I can see that. I can see why people would see that now. I've been and, sat with John on numerous occasions. One of the smartest humans I've been around in a very long time, very knowledgeable, especially on the uh, topic of racism. Well, he's it's, it's, he's made it his life's work of course, to some yeah. extent. And, yeah, and and you, you listen. I'm I'm not going to even try and say I know what it is. All I could give you is what is your view, my view, yeah. um, and my lived experiences. Final question: You're still a player. Mm -hmm. um, I don't doubt. After Just about. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you're still a player, um, and you still want to play. Yes, sir. Um, and I think speaking to you. I think you're gonna. I think you're the sort of person, and I'm not just saying it because you're sat here, mate. Mm. I think you're the sort of person that can do anything you turn your mind to, mm. and I think that if you want to be in football management, you're going to find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad to hear you've got your coaches, mm. coaching badges, and you're going to go that route. And potentially, if, if you want to do it, I think I think I don't doubt. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt that listening to you uh, and and hearing what you have to say in the way that you present yourself, that you're going to be just fine whatever you choose. Thank you. But. When you look at the world and you look at how you've interacted with it, because you've got a reputation of being a straight talker. Yes. You're probably a PR department's not, n oh, nightmare yeah, at times. Yeah, yeah. all right, times. Right. <laughs> but how do you believe you're perceived? Or does it even matter to you? Um, it, it matters by the people that see me daily. What right. do, and it's funny, actually, because we're coming down to this. Be careful, you know, Simon's tricky. Is he? Maybe time with me, sound straight up. But I think I've been respectful, vice versa. You have, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, it's just it's going to be a conversation. All right, how are you going to present yourself this time? As myself. Me? I am <laughs> yeah, who I am. Yeah. Am I an idiot at times? Yeah. Am I an emotional wreck at times? Yes. But also, I'm 35. What's gone on that way the last yeah. 20 years has probably shaped this. But what's going on this next twenty years is a completely different yeah, person. It's an opportunity. Yeah, yeah and yeah. it's gonna be it's gonna be fantastic. So when I go for job interviews, who who am I? When I'm all of these things, yeah. I'm Some not gonna say to you now, yeah. I'm, you know, I've got this wonderful presentation. So you're you're the, mm. the chairman, I've got this wonderful presentation. This is how it is, is what it's and you go, but I saw you in the media. Yeah. Do you know what? There's probably a strong possibility I will have an outburst. But the reason I've done that now to combat that is I've got this team around me of all older people. Old more more older, more wise. I'm probably going to speak to them before I go speak to the players. This is how it's going to be. And I under, I just understand myself so much more now. So if, if if somebody, if the five people in this room had an opinion on me, one will say they like me, one will say they hate yeah. me, one will say this. But one thing that everyone will have to do is respect me. Yeah.
and that is that that is more worth its weight in gold to me. So if you don't respect me, it's probably a you problem because I'm not rude, mm. I'm, I'm not trying to hurt anybody, and I'm not going out my way for clickbait. I'm actually just trying to be what I would call an old school gentleman with values and core beliefs. And if if that offends you, I apologise. But well, I'm trying come, to do that. That's come I've... across very clear, Troy, and I've really enjoyed it. And thank you for being upfront. Thank you. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. Future episodes can be found on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.